So today you're going to hear from Ollie Pope, who is a test cricketer for England. Um, he's also an old Cranleyan. Um, he was with us for five years, left to four or five years ago now. What I wanted to try and do, because he's had a lot of media attention, is actually come at it from a slightly different angle. So I asked his parents to join uh, the interview. Um, what I wanted to try and get from it was what it was like having a child uh, going from 16, 17, 18, uh, the conflict, I guess, in the thought process with university route, uh, rather than just straight into professional sport, what it's been like uh, watching their child kind of go up the ladder so quickly, um, advice to other parents in terms of uh, how to support their, their child, uh, what it's like watching him play or making his test debut, um, how to deal with agents, and, and I found it fascinating, and I found it a real insight into an area really of sport that very few of us will ever understand. It's that idea of what it's like to have a child in professional sport. Ollie is a very impressive young man. He's someone who has dedicated themselves, not just to cricket, but just being a great person. Um, speaking to our director of cricket, Mr. Welsh, uh, all those years ago, I remember him always saying to me how talented he was, but what a great young man he, he was back then. And he's continued that. And you see the interviews or any time he's in the papers, um, even when he was in Australia, that he was actually talked about in Parliament, given the commendation for his behaviour and his manner. And above everything, that is the most important, that he's a great human being. And the thing that I took away from it was Ollie's desire to always be present. That mindset that if you're with a friend or you're... Uh, doing an interview or you're playing cricket or your training is to be present, be in the moment, enjoy the moment, be truly focused on it, try not to be distracted. And that's a lesson I think I've learned from, from Ollie. And although I taught him uh, A-level PE um, and I knew him when he was 12, 13 years old, I've learned something from him from this interview. I've learned about that concept of being present. Have a watch. I found it fascinating. I just want to thank Ollie. Uh, he was in uh, India when we did this interview. He was in quarantine in a hotel room, but also Richard and Sue uh, for giving up their time uh, to tell us a side of a story that maybe some people um, don't ever hear about. I hope you enjoy it um, and have a listen. Right, tell me what's high performance mean to you then, Ollie? Uh, I think it's the main thing for me and from a cricket point of view especially is sort of putting putting what you practice into performance. I think you can, um, fr from a cricket point of view, you can spend hours on end in the nets. Um, you, I've watched some of the best net players in the world and I've seen I've seen guys go out and train unbelievably and then be pretty average cricketers um, when they get out on the pitch. Um, so I guess for me, it's finding a way of putting all the hours and the hard work and channeling that in the right way, which probably comes into the anxiety and channeling your anxiety and your sort of excitement when you're on the pitch and putting everything you've learned into that and then sort of executing on the pitch when it matters the most because it, it, you can you can train all you want and you can put in all the hours but essentially if you can't if you can't execute what you you're doing off the pitch um then i think then that's probably for me what what really sums it up oh, and kind of watching you join the school um so you 13 and then going through you were always a highly talented cricketer was there an age where you thought to yourself or a point you thought actually this is something i potentially could do professionally or i think i can really make it here uh i wasn't i was always good at cricket but i wasn't amazing i wasn't a standout really in my age group i never got picked for the the regional stuff until i was I think 16 um so i i was always trying every sport and whatever season it was i would i put everything into that but cricket would always be going on in the background in the winter as well so i do i do my sort of football or hockey or, or rugby training and then have a, have a net after that so it was always there it was always there in the background um probably when i got to 17 i realized right i've got i've got a decent shot at making it um uh, to a professional level at Surrey. So that was probably the, the year group where I kicked on a little bit. And was that just a gut feeling? Or was that what people were saying to you? Did you kind of, because lots of boys will go through, and girls will go through their kind of school sports career 
hoping to make it. Um, and then some will have that horrible moment where they get kind of dropped or they get released from um, an academy or something like that. Um, and I'll always talk to them about, well, what do you think? Do you think you're good enough? Was it that internally you thought I'm good enough for this or was it that Surrey or Stu Welsh, the director of cricket, was telling you that or your parents? What was it? Probably, I probably didn't think I was necessarily good enough to make it a professional at that at that age group. I remember it's probably Neil Stewart's, uh, Alex Stewart's um, brother who gave me the confidence and and I, I wasn't sort of grinding out massive hundreds every week like I should have been for the Surrey under 17s or anything like that. But he, he always, I'd have a net with him and be like, oh, you're, you're going to be, you're going to be a good player. And I'd be like, I'd listen to it and I'd take it on board. And I was like thinking, ah, oh, he probably just says this to all his, all his players to give him a bit of confidence for the week. But he's, um, he's probably the one that really made me believe um that that I was good at that age and I had the talent and then it was just about channeling it so obviously Welshie at Surrey was was great at sort of helping me challenge that potential and the talent and then making making myself into sort of a professional from a from a young age so I think but Neil Stewart gave me the confidence so it's probably an external thing more more so than than me thinking oh geez I'm good yeah and then and as parents watching because I I think maybe Ollie's being a bit humble there, kid, and well, she spoke so highly of him as soon as he joined the school. When did you as parents start to realise that cricket could well be what Ollie does in the future or even that short-term future? Um, I think I agree with what Ollie said. I think when he was going through the age group stuff at Surrey, he was always good enough to hold his, comfortably hold his place um, within, the, within that group, whatever age group it was. And then... When he, I, I think it was when he got to the under 17s. I th and I thought at that stage, well, it's fine. He can hold his place in, in a Surrey under 15 or 14 or 16 side. But when he gets to 18, it's open, the competitions from, yeah, you know, he's competing against guys from 18 up to you know, their mid 30s. And it's a real bottleneck there. But when he was 17, he, he had a very strong year for Surrey. He scored, I think I remember you scored, Oli, your first century for for sorry in a, in a in, in a county game and then it just sort of at that point it sort of escalated quite quickly and i suppose from 17 we thought well perhaps there's a chance we weren't confident that it was going to you know it was going to happen but we thought well it's not it's not impossible and then and how hard is it then because like i said to you before i, I get probably two or three parents maybe a year uh talking to me about um their roots so it might be a their son or daughter has the opportunity to take a pro contract like Ollie did uh, or head off to university and there's that dilemma of, of what to do. How hard was it for you as parents? I tried to steer Ollie to go to university actually because um, I suppose we both went to university and it's, it's like it didn't work out but the, he wasn't having anything of it. He, you did your UCAS form, didn't you, Ollie? And um, applied and got places offered. Um, we, but I don't think you ever intended to go, did you? Even though we tried to steer you in that direction. We um, we we sort of um, kicked the can down the road a bit because in the summer when he finished his A levels, um, we we said, okay, let's defer the place at Loughborough for a year. And Ollie said, yeah, whatever. He knew he wasn't going. But we thought, OK, well, at least if, you know, if the next year doesn't go well at all, then we've got that, an option. He's got an option of a place at Loughborough. Yeah. Having given effectively two summers, the summer of his, a, of his A levels and the following summer to, to cricket and see what happens. And then within three months of leaving, yeah, finishing his A levels, he then got to play in one of the for, sorry, in, one, in a one-day game, and that's when he got his he got a contract, and there wasn't really much discussion of university afterwards. But um, so that was the kind of compromise. Yeah, it didn't it? feel very stressful um, because I've, it, we always had well, Ollie always had that place for the first year to go to later on, um, and we I think even suggested deferring it again for another year. <laughs> but um, we've still got a place for you next year. Yeah. <laughs> You're obviously rubbing shoulders with people a bit younger from, than you, your own age group, but also kind of men who are, I guess, at that point of retiring. Have they given you any advice about actually 
start to have a look at what you might do after cricket or is it or in your head are you just like look i'm at the start of this journey and actually i'll think about it in an, a few years time or have you started to think what you might want to start to learn how to do um i'll be honest not really um i think i, I watched how different guys go about their their careers and there's guys in the Surrey changing room that, have, that study are currently studying degrees and some courses online and there's there's I'm not sure I don't think any of the England boys are and I think in my mind while I'm in the England setup and while while I'm I've still got a spot in the in the squad or in the side then I think that's sort of just my my focus and I've I've got hopefully I've got a long career um so I think to, to be honest until until I'm out of the England setup and a little bit older that's when I'll probably start thinking a little bit more about um life after cricket and I, I I can't see I can't see my life leaving cricket to be honest at the moment whether that be sort of coaching after cricket or who, who knows so I'll be honest yeah not not a massive amount has gone through my mind other than sort of what's going on the next day what's my what's my training session like you went from 18 leaving school to suddenly what three years late oh sorry um three months later kind of making a debut I guess for Surrey to suddenly being a bit in Australia and within what your test debut at 21 everything seemed to go pretty quickly the kind of the escalation from being an 18 year old leaving school very good cricketer to suddenly playing against india at, at lords that's a remarkably quick kind of evolution as a, a sports person how was how was it going up the, the kind of the ladder did you did you always feel quite comfortable going up the ladder or were there moments where you looked around and said what am i doing like how am i here uh, a little bit of that. I remember, I think it was probably when I was just making my debut that week, I was a little bit like, what, what's going on here? I think I was the second, I think I remember reading a stat and I hated reading the stats at the time because I didn't really want to set myself up for failure. But I was like the second least cap first class player to get picked for England after Jimmy Anderson. And then there was a lot of chat about how I was going to bat at four when when I'd only ever batted for six or five at Surrey and I just wanted to dodge all that stuff because it just made me think they're just trying to almost just set me up to fail in a way and I and then I remember but I remember going in pretty confident um I felt I mean I only played two games in my first stint for England and and I remember that first game felt good second game felt okay didn't have much going my way and um it was I, I think i remember just looking around at lords we it was the dream week really i mean it would have been more of a dream if we got 100 but we we were playing the number one side in the world i'd only played 14 first class games i remember it was day four i think and standing at deep square leg i've got my mate sam curran a few few meters away uh, and he was in a similar similar boat and um we were just looking around, being like, "This is mad." Jimmy Anderson's running in, Cook stood at slip, and that I think that was a bit of a pinch yourself moment, where it was all a bit, a bit surreal because it had happened so quickly. Um, and I don't think it's until you until you spend a lot of time with the guys and until you put in a performance, you don't really feel like you're part of it because people come and go on the England side uh, a lot. So it, that's when you realise, right? I've now the dreams sort of just starting now and I just want to make that spot my own um, and then until you're settled in the side I think that's quite a hard thing to do. And as parents that first contract so again a, a number of I've spoken to mainly in the rugby world that not confusion but that suddenly they are in a in this kind of professional sports world where you're not quite sure what you should be signing how long you should sign for what's my child worth how, how you organize it all did you have an agent at that time as parents in terms of or did you sort it out with ollie and how did how did you deal with with all um, you went to see alex stewart didn't you with ollie no i i spoke to yeah we had a had a conversation um th this is where because ollie it was a bit of a rush he had to sign the contract before he played in that semi-final the one day cup semi-final up at headingley so, and so alex just said look he's you've got a con he's got a he can't play unless he's he's got a con for some reason or it's on, I can't remember. But um, so there wasn't much time to, to go through it. And I kind of realized I wanted to have a look at it and go through it in detail. But I, in my heart of hearts, I realized there's, there's not much I can do about it or, or you know, there's nothing I can change. It's pretty much set in stone. And, you know, there was, I can't remember, there, was, there wasn't anything too contentious in there anyway. Um, so it was fairly, it was, it was fairly straightforward. It, it was probably more when Ollie signed a, um, an agreement 
we were looking for an agent or Ollie was looking for an agent with a bit of help from us in the background um, when he switched about um, a year ago was it Ollie we met a few and and then I, I was perhaps a tiny bit more involved and, and as parents what were you looking for in in agents or in an agent because you met a few were there certain characteristics you were looking for or certain things you were kind of looking it was for? Ollie really who decided totally Ollie wasn't it yeah um so I guess, Ollie, then, that, that, yeah, I guess that question to you, slightly to you then, Ollie, in terms of what were you looking for? Because, again, you're 18, 19, 20, people will say oh, you may need an agent, or even now younger sportsmen and women are getting asked at 16 maybe to sign a contract here and there. What were you looking for? I think from, from the air, so I've obviously now experienced two, two agents, and um I think they're, they're actually very important in that you, you don't want to get it wrong with them because, I mean, I met up when I was changing agents with uh, probably three, four, five different different agencies who were all very keen. And it was interesting to see how they how they went about sort of selling themselves and selling them. And and uh, to be honest, the financially what they wanted as well. So it then came down to I didn't I wanted to make sure I didn't want whoever's going to try and sort of sell me as a as a person I wanted someone who's just going to look after my game and I didn't want the chat when I met the when I met the agent sorry just to be all about money and they're going to take x percent of this and x percent of that um so that's probably why I went with who I did um this time round because you want someone with good contacts so probably more so when you go up the levels a little bit because they can get you sponsorships and and deals with this some good big companies um but at first you want i guess you want someone who's not gonna someone who's respected within the sport but someone who's who's not gonna just try and take take a chunk of your professional money because as a, as a young sportsman when you're signing your contract you're not you're not earning a massive amount of money and there's not a lot the agents can do to try and sell your case um so you almost want some in my opinion you don't want someone who's going to take any of your whether that be a, a rugby contract or a contract with Surrey or anyone like that at, at that age because there's only so much they can do there there there's there's not really they can't justify taking 10 percent because i don't think they they do enough at that age um to to justify that yeah there was um, sorry just to add to that there was um one or two i met one or two with ollie and there's one that had already had some quite big england names and then there was so there was an element of thinking well if Ollie went with that age, and where would he be in their sort of pecking order? Because you come with is a sort of trying to find a balance, someone with the with a good profile, with good contacts, who's going to look after Ollie, but not someone who already had, you know, um, some 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 really big names, um, whereby Ollie might just get sort of shoved down the pecking order. And did you did you talk to the other players about it, Ollie? I spoke to a few guys and spoke to my mates at Sam and Tom Curran, and again similar situation that they're, they're young players breaking into the England side I didn't really want to be competing for a deal with them so I, I think who who I've who I've gone with is is quite big in rugby and other sports as well so he's got those good contacts and he doesn't have too many too many cricketers um at the doing a similar thing to me at the moment so it's quite a nice position for me to be in um so it, it's getting that balance because you don't want someone brand new to it because they're not necessarily they're not necessarily respected by by the counties and the clubs yet. I don't think. Um, so you want someone respected within the within the sport a little bit, but it, it's just getting that right mix. Your debut, but more, but probably being quite specific with this. Suddenly, you've got your pads on. You're waiting to go to bat. You have to just kind of have that nervous wait anyway, because like anyone who plays cricket, you're not quite sure when you're going in, and then you realise you are going in. Can you try and remember back, because I'm going to ask your parents in a sec about this. What was that walk like? What were you thinking? Was it excitement? Was it anxiety? Like, can you remember it? Because a lot of people sometimes talk about, you know, just the blur. Can you remember that time? Um, I remember it a little bit. Um, well, actually, uh, I remember sort of clippets of it and um, it was... I never, I never enjoy waiting to bat. I never really enjoy the walk out to bat because cricket's a funny old sport. You might, you might get a great ball first up, and you might be walking straight back to the pavilion, um, or you might play an average shot. So it's about, 
it's about trying to uh, sort of channel everything. So I remember quite clearly, I wanted just to take it in. I'm playing, I'm walking out. It's a sunny day at Lords. It's day, I think it was like day two or three and it was a packed house. And I got one of the nicest applauds you'll ever get because everyone knew it was some young kid making their debut, walking through the long room. Um, Alistair Cook had just got out. So I was like, my first thing was, do I let him come up the stairs first or do I do to see? And he waited by the bottom. So I had to get, kept past him and then walking out to bat I saw I saw Ashwin sort of just starting to walk towards me and eye me up a little bit to try and probably get in my ear or something and then the skipper Joe Root was at the other end so he came and sort of met me halfway um and then I think cricket's uh my biggest thing in cricket is whatever happens five days out from the test and the training session for the for those five days really nothing is nothing really matters it's all about that that split second so I knew in my mind I can take all this in I can enjoy the crowd sort of all eyes on me and have a look around but as soon as I step and sort of tap my bat on the ground and I'm there everything is sort of I don't want to say I don't want to say back to normal um but I'm back on a cricket pitch I'm about to face a ball like I am for Sturry like I did for Cranley like I did for everybody and that's when it became a little bit normal see that that's that for me is amazing, Ollie, because even when I play village cricket, I first ball on thinking, just don't get up, just don't get up. This and that's just that's just village cricket with with no meaning to it. So, have you have you worked on that mindset to that your first delivery, whether it's uh, at, was at Cranley or in this your Test match, when you're batting that first delivery, is your mind just completely kind of in a zone where you're you're not having those negative thoughts? You're actually thinking to yourself, where am I scoring? Yeah, that that zone becomes a lot easier to get into once once you face thirty balls. But that's what I try and aim for. Um, I think the the first ball is always challenging. That's, I like to watch a lot from the balcony and know exactly how the bowler is trying to get me out. But I'm very much I try and I try and not think too much. As and like I said, as soon as I tap that bat, all I'm thinking about is right. Uh, ideally, where can I get off strike? So the field position. So I'll have a little look and just to get off the mark. Um, and yeah, it's it's hard because you you need to try avoid those negative thoughts of don't get out. It's not it's not because if you're getting out, then that even the word out in your mind is just not what you want to be thinking about. So when you run into a bit of bad bad form as well, that that sort of the intensity of that increases a little bit. Um, but you've got to trust trust your work for days before the game. And like I said, as soon as I tap that bat, I'm sort of I try and free my mind a little bit and just watch the ball. If I'm telling myself watch the ball, then it's just obviously you're going to watch the ball. It doesn't it doesn't take much to realise that, but it's just trying to avoid the negative thoughts mm. as long as I've got something positive in my mind. And as parents, were you just in a nervous wreck the whole time? Um, yes. <laughs> was it was it sheer was it just sheer delight, emotions, nerves? I think. I, um... Uh, the build up to that test, the Lord's test, the first day was a washout. So I, I was there with a couple of mates and we just spent most of the day drinking. Day two, I had a client there and we were fielding. So that was nice and relaxed. So yeah, day three was when Ollie went out to bat. And yeah, it was, it was a bit weird. It, it's very nerve wracking. I think we felt very proud, but incredibly um, proud. it was very nerve wracking. I remember um, they, the parents and um, families were all sat together um, and I was sitting next to Keaton Jennings' mum and um, just as Ollie came out she just put a hand on my arm and she said be strong <laughs> and that just made me crumble <laughs> it was pathetic um, but I think you just like probably it's like the mirror of Ollie as he, as he gets into his innings you know you, you sort of you feel a sort of sense of release yeah. and a bit of bit of pressure's released and then you just start to enjoy it enjoy and it you enjoy it more and more and i guess it's a reflection you know it's sort of similar emotions to ollie but from our perspective you know when you're on the sideline there's nothing you can do about it at least if you're there you can you know, ollie's in the thick of it and yeah. so but we can't we don't have any distractions we're just watching from 100 yards away and has, uh, has it got easier now every time kind of uh, no, not, uh, no. Say, no, not necessarily but again it's just you know when you get through get through the first bit and then you start to relax relax a bit yeah. and you're with that debut you had time that you could really kind of enjoy the moment did you 
because I, I guess you'd probably dreamt about it since you were well I don't know what age but I presume kind of a young man did you have a chance to kind of look around and go wow look where I am yeah I did yeah like like I said that that end of the game when we'd won I knew we weren't going to bat again um we nearly we needed two wickets they were still 200 or, or something like that behind um so at that point yes um but the the week the week leading up to it as as it is with the lord's test i remember i was i was very nervous and more more nervous than i thought it would because it, everything had happened so quickly i remember I sat down for breakfast I, I don't really read um but i thought i'd um sit down for breakfast open the paper and just try and switch off from the game and then i saw my face in the front page i was like right brilliant like try to <laughs> flick, flick over so it's like right this it is what it is and I remember the day before I tried to see a mate for a coffee um, near Lords and just try to do anything just to take my mind off basically that that first ball um, because all, all you want on your debut is just to get off the mark you don't want to be you don't want to be that guy who gets a duck on debut and then you're going into the second innings being like oh, imagine if I've got another one and so it, it was incredibly nervous uh, and then I guess after the game I could really sort of enjoy it um, sat on the balcony for a bit we had had a beer with um, Sam Curran out there and he, it was only his I think third test match and you know, we got a nice picture in the changing room as a team uh, and then I remember walking back to um, so our hotel is probably a 10 minute walk from the ground and I remember walking back and it was me, Joe Root and uh, Alistair Cook. And we, those two had a beer in hand. I was like, right, I better, no beer, just get my, get my uh, training kit on. And they had a beer just walking back at probably like 10 o'clock. And as they do uh, after a test, you, you've got to enjoy it, especially if you win. Um, so I remember looking, I was like, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. And um, what is it like playing in a test? What, what is, what's the difference between test match and let's say first class cricket? Obviously, the standard does does go up that that new level, but sometimes in first class cricket you can face an attack with four four international seamers. So, um, obviously the level does go up. Uh, I think it's just everything that comes with it as well. I think after a test match, whether it goes really well or bad, you're just knackered by the end of it. It's whether you score a hundred and the team wins, or you don't don't get a run and the team the team gets hammered. You you leave that test match and you're like. Phew five days that was that was tough work and I, I think just as much mentally as it is um physically and we're about to face India and I'm sure we're going to experience exactly the same it's going to be some some tough cricket played out there and I think it's obviously the media around it increases that a little bit um and the, just the pressure of knowing that this is your shot this is you're playing for England in international sport you know that if you have three or four bad games you could be you could be out and who knows when you get and that, that's always going to be in the mind of, of any cricketer especially when they're when they're starting out or any sportsman you know it doesn't take a massive amount at international level to to sort of get get dropped from the team so it's trying to channel everything you can into that test and do everything you can to make yourself successful and and if not trying to trying to sweep it no and sweep it under and you've got to reset and go again maybe like three or four days later the thing that uh, Stuart Welsh talks about the whole time is at no point when he watches you bat at whatever level you go up at no point do you look like you're not out kind of that you're struggling or that you're suddenly out of your depth or they found a weakness or something you always look comfortable now that's not to say that you're always going to get a hundred but do you feel that do you feel that when you're batting it looks yeah. like always comfortable at the crease. Yeah, a lot of the time, to be honest, I, I get myself out. I, looking back, I sort of I'm always the one to get myself out. Rather, a lot of the time, rather than the bowler, rather than I go that was a good ball. I like to think I'm pretty good at keeping the good balls out in general. Um, but yeah, I feel that way. Just having this, like, I think I've got a good solid technique, and that would help me deal with that. Twenty-three. Obviously, so early on in your your kind of your sports career, um, and you've achieved some amazing stuff already. Like no one can ever take away the fact you're now a, an international Test match cricketer. Do you do you now start to think right? I see Test matches as real opportunities to to keep progressing, or do you still have that? Well, I don't want to lose all this. I, I kind of I don't want this to be taken away because I'm loving it so much. Is your do you start to feel the longer you're in that kind of culture? That you spoke so highly of uh, previously to me 
do you now look at it now and think, okay, this this is just amazing and it's just an opportunity to get better and better and better? Or do you still have those nerves and those anxieties of getting dropped? Yeah, I think it's obviously your form does vary that a little bit. I think you've always got a fear of getting dropped in the back of your mind. I think that's just sport. And that's that's one of the challenges of it is thinking that you might be four days out from a match and you might in your mind be, geez, if I have a bad game, I might not play the next one, but that's, that's okay. You've got to, in my mind, embrace those thoughts. That's fine because it's not going to change what I do when I'm out there. Like I've, I've said before, once you're out there as, as a cricketer, you've got to be switched on for a split second when you're facing the ball, then you can switch off. But those negative thoughts aren't going to be going through my head as I'm, as the ball is running in. So it's fine to think like that, but, then there's also the point that I look around the changing room, I look at Ben Stokes and what he's done uh, for English cricket and I think, oh geez, I wanna I wanna do that. I wanna be I wanna be Ben Stokes, I wanna be Joe Root when I'm older. I wanna have their record and play as many games as them. So it, it's a mixture of the two, but those those thoughts are fine and uh, you, you can the big thing for me is embracing them and thinking that this isn't this isn't gonna change how I play. It's fine to think that that's okay. Um, it's not going to affect my performance. And as parents, is it has it been an enjoyable four or five years? Has, has it been challenging? Has there been moments where it's been hard? I know Ollie's had a couple of injuries now as well. <laughs> when you, I, when I think a bit of every, all those three, but um, we've, overriding we've, everything, yeah, it's been massively enjoyable. Yeah, we've absolutely loved it. It's and good fun. We sort of trotted over, you know, around the world after him to watch him play when he was in the Surrey Academy, they had a couple of trips to South Africa and then one to Sri Lanka. And we've been out to see him play in New Zealand. It's been, it's, it has formed a big part of our lives, but in a really good, positive way, we've loved it. But and we've met, we've made some good mates through it yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, and the hard time. Yeah, sort of. The hard time. Well, his yeah, his his yeah, his injuries unquestionably, you know, yeah. because you see what what he's what he's <laughs> what he's had to go through with the with the with the recuperation, the frustration of not being able to play. Although the timing of the second injury could not have been better, because it was you know right his second shoulder injury was on the penultimate day of the last test of the summer. So if ever you got a four or five month period out of the game, you know that would have been the ideal time. So that that helped, but. Um, yeah, no, unquestionably. And just felt so sorry for him yeah. when it happened. <clears throat> I think also um, he had a he had a slight, slight challenge in the we played in the one day cup final at Lords, Surrey against um, Knotts, and um, this is the summer of I think two thousand and eighteen, so two and a half years ago, and um, he. Um, he put down a catch. He put down Alex Sales, who went on to score 180, 190. And that, you know, arguably was the pivotal moment of the game. And that was Ollie's first game on the big stage, live on seat, uh, live, live on Sky, packed house at Lords. And he sort of, when he came across after the game, he sort of cut a fairly lonely figure when he was walking across to us after everyone had gone. And then seeing how he dealt and how we with the next few days because he was going straight into the t20 season um within literally the following weekend and we both that that was quite a challenging few days just quite anxious as to how he was going to deal with that and he managed to switch off so it appeared to us he saw a lot of his mates during the week and then on that sunday that's probably one of the nervous i've ever been watching him because of what had just happened at lords he went out and had a really good knock in his first T20 game against whoever it was and scored a quick 30 or 40 and it was just he kind of sort of snapped out of it and um yeah so that was quite that was quite a challenging moment and I was quite unbelievably proud of how he sort of dealt with that and I guess it might be that kind of you suddenly it's just out of your control isn't it as parents you you kind of seen your son you just have to be there as a you know support in the background really quietly there yeah. to be Vent, to be vented on <laughs> that. we just felt really sorry for him and the team were it was really nice to see how the team were aware of how ollie felt as well i remember after the match because he was so gutted i don't think i've ever seen you so gutted about anything um 
And Kumar Sangakara was amazing. He looked after you. He came up and had a little word with us, saying he'd been through exactly the same himself. And they rallied around you pretty well, I think, didn't they? Yeah. Was that was that what really helped you there, Ollie, or how did you get through that? Because I, I guess the, the 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 better player you are and the higher you go, when you do make mistakes, they get highlighted, don't they? It, don't, it only takes you to play one bad shot or play a shot that the commentators think is a bit rash. You get caught, it slip, and suddenly it's like, oh well, what's he done that for? How, how are you? Are you able to block out that noise? Uh. I am now, not at the time though, I don't think. Um, I remember I, was, I, I let that affect me probably more that I don't really talk about when, especially back home, even with psychologists, I don't necessarily like say the whole time exactly how I'm, how I'm feeling. I just sort of keep, keep quiet a little bit, which is probably what you shouldn't do. Um, but that was, I struggled really at the time. I remember looking at Twitter and I was like, oh, just getting slated by everyone and, um, but it set me up well. I mean, I, now if that happened to me, look, I'd be I'd be gutted. But I wouldn't let it affect me. I don't think off the pitch. I'd be I'd be obviously very disappointed. And yeah, but I wouldn't let let that have too much of an effect of how I go about my day to day life because we play so much cricket. There's always something around the corner. I mean, look at look at Ben Stokes. He's to watch how he goes about it. He almost just has a laugh about that that final over he bowled in the World Cup um, where they got twenty odd off it, but you got to motivate yourself and he's won England a world cup in that ridiculous ashes series. So he can, uh, you, you find a way of bouncing back and you got those guys to speak to as well when, when it does hit the fan. And it's, you come across remarkably mature for, for a guy who's 23. And, and I mean that in the biggest compliment. Um, and I, I know from a school's perspective, how proud we are, but strangely how proud we are, was emphasised when you went to Australia and was it the New South Wales uh, politician kind of commented on your behaviour out there and and I remember actually at the time how the school saw that as near enough as bigger than you making that test debut just that kind of that concept that you just become such a great human being and that people were out there going you know what Ollie Pope's a fantastic cricketer but actually what you are like is a bloke there's now going to become that element of kind of um, fame and notoriety to it. As parents, have you have you noticed kind of the pressures of, of fame and notoriety on Ollie? Has, has that changed him at all? Has it? Is it something that you haven't really kind of noticed? It's only Ollie Pope's parents and kind of. Oh, we are. We are. We are only Ollie Pope's parents now. We don't have names. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can imagine, and and you and kind of your daughter as well. Suddenly. When, when Ollie's in the paper and it's kind of like talking yeah. here and there and that I kind of, I've never read a few articles where you just, the parents of Ollie, um, rather yeah. than actually... No, we don't have names. You don't have names, you're just Ollie's parents. Exactly. Yeah, we're quite, like, where we live, we've, it's a nice little village and um, we've got a little village pub that we all like to go down and eat in when we can. Um, and... Yeah, Ollie, it's that's the only time we really experience it because Ollie gets people try and come up and chat to him and um, kind of want to shield him a little bit in yeah. a way. But Ollie's quite good at sort of managing people and um, and being polite and quietly sort of moving on. But uh, that's the only time. No, I we think really he's taking it. it. I, I think he's taking it in his stride. I think. Yeah. He's dealt with the um the attention extraordinarily well and do you still enjoy signing autographs yeah i think it's there's i don't i don't you, you don't dislike it but i wouldn't say i like it it's just sort of background noise in a way like that it's just something that comes with it and it's not something that you see some people who sort of they they want they want that that's why they that's why they do it that's what sort of strives them on to to like they, they want to be famous and get 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 attention um but it's just sort of background noise really in a way it's sort of just fluff as well i think if you if you're out and just strolling around getting a coffee and someone asks for a selfie i i just have a have a chat with them and and just be be a decent bloke because it's not really it's it's easy for you to give them 30 seconds and it if they love cricket it might make their day so but it doesn't it doesn't really bother me too much like I don't get excited by it because it's like 
it, whatever it doesn't doesn't change anything um for me so it, it's being just being a half decent bloke because you know it can really affect someone's day or make make them happy if 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 they if it's sort of a young kid and they 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 love their cricket so it's just yeah coming across in the right way and do you feel like you sacrificed a lot for it or is it because a lot of people we talk about and, and it's probably what your parents would have seen i guess and what a lot of people probably haven't or don't ever see is the hours and the sacrifices you've made where most people potentially go to university yes they get a degree but they probably have a lot of a certain kind of level of fun with uni do you feel like these last three four years those sacrifices uh, they're clearly paying off but have you sacrificed a lot do you feel like you've sac made some sacrifices yeah absolutely i think uh, i noticed it a lot more sort of straight after school all my mates were off off traveling and off doing these um just sort of having having a great time to be honest and off to uni and going out and i think now i've i've matured probably a lot over the last year or so um i've realized i've watched these guys and i'm playing with guys guys on this tour is probably i don't know if there's another sort of single i'm the only single one they've all got families and kids and wives so it makes you it does make you realize in a way like right i've got a you've got to make these dedications and that just become becomes the norm. I think, think I've matured a lot over the last year or so. Um, and you realize that when you do get to the top level, I'm in a, I'm in a lucky enough position now I'm in the squad and, um, and I'm, I'm living the dream and I, I want to, this is what I want to do for, for the next 15 years. So I'm happy to dedicate sort of whatever I can and put everything in into into making sure I'm I'm at the the top level for as long as I can and that that doesn't guarantee me me not going to a party or something it doesn't guarantee me scoring runs doesn't mean I'm going to be successful but it's just trying to make sure I do I do everything I can to to be successful on the pitch but... just a quick hello from Jackson <laughs> Yeah, he, he keeps me on the straight and narrow. He's, uh, and this he's is, my company. Have you got what a year ago or so, and then have dumped onto your parents every time you head off? Oh, more recent than that. He's yeah. Five months old. Five, six old, six months. Yeah. And how hard is it touring? Because obviously, people are saying, and Mr. Burgess, who I interviewed uh, a couple of weeks ago, talked about kind of being away from his wife and kids. You've talked there about being single. Is it lonely touring? Um, the life of a cricketer, I've read a number of books on it where in the county game you're kind of going hotel to hotel and uh, country to country. It, are you still at that age where actually it's just an excitement and that enjoyment of kind of new cultures and new countries or can it get lonely? Oh, it can. I mean, obviously... <laughs> Shut up. Sorry. Obviously, Sorry. COVID... There's a tractor going past. <laughs> we'll let him go. There you go. He's um so yeah it can be um but we've I've got the, the guys you tour with become become your best mates really um so I think probably a little bit more so when when they've all got their wives and families out then that's when because they often all all are out at the same time um so that's when it can be a little bit more like what now so I just go sort of tag along with tag along with one of them and when you go to somewhere like we're, we're in India I'm in India at the moment and. I haven't, because of COVID, we, we've been, this is day five in our room on our own. So we haven't actually left our rooms yet, really. Um, so there are times where you spend a lot of time in your hotel room, but there's always someone to to sort of go for a coffee with if you're on tour or have a, go, go for a nice bite to eat in the evening with. So it, it can be lonely, but you just sort of, you learn, you learn to deal with it. And as parents, because I, I know I said I'll keep it down 15 to like 10 more minutes or so, but but as parents now, looking back, so it's what, five years since you left Cranley. Um, if you were a parent now with a child, 16, 17, 18, who's starting to think about kind of professional sport, through your experiences, do you have any advice for them? Things that you would say, actually, this is what I wish Mr. Houston school or we had known kind of beforehand, or... Is it just something you can't really learn and you just got to go with it and you just got to be there for your child? Um, I think um, I think what we've tried to do is sort of maintain a balance as much as we can. So, we're, we're, well, two things. When Ollie was at school, we um, 
I think it was Sue's word, expression, not mine. So I could, should um, we try to facilitate things rather than be too pushy. So enable him to go to the matches, the training, to pick him up from school, to take him to the nets in the evening during the week. But equally, and with very much with the support of Cranley, um, make sure he kept up on top of his, kept on top of his work because you know if the cricket hadn't sort of materialised and he had flunked his A levels and as a result couldn't go to university, that would have been a disaster. The but, school, I think, the school was so, fabulous. Yeah, actually. they were. In, yeah, Ollie's, how, Andy Logan was great. I think wasn't he? Um, so yeah, they we were very felt really as if we were just working with. Cranley all the way through we were never at odds and it was really good balance and yeah they they were superb um and then I think what we've tried to do and this is perhaps advice to other parents whoever they asked for it is just try and create as much of a balance and when Ollie comes away from cricket not to just be grilling him on cricket because we've got lots of and me in particular because I'm fascinated by the game and you've become more and more interested obviously through Ollie but not to spend our time asking the questions that Ollie probably gets asked day in, day out, and to try and talk about other things. So when he comes home, you know, he, he's got, um, he can switch off from cricket and just, just immerse himself in other stuff. So that's, I guess, one thing. And also, um, yeah, not trying to, yeah, not never being too pushy. And I don't think we've ever been pushy. And, no. um, you know, if, if, he, if he asks for our advice, we're, you know, obviously we we'll, we give it in the best way we can, but just you know, just to support him and um, yeah, I'd say we say that's a fair comment, all. Yeah, yeah, I'd say I sort of keep my keep cricket maybe too much in your eyes. I don't know. Keep cricket and sort of family and friends life. I try and keep it as se separate as possible. It's quite. I've got a mate called uh, well, Robin Masters actually one of my best mates. It's quite nice. So I'll go for. I'll, after a big series where it's just been cricket for months and then I'll see him after and he'll be like, oh, so do you, how'd you do? Did you win? And he, he won't have a clue about it, but he won't, he won't bother asking the sort of stupid questions. And it's just really refreshing that, that you don't, the, the worst thing is just when you, you make a conversation and someone half follows it and they, they don't really know what they're asking and trying to talk about cricket because they think that I want to talk about cricket, but we spend so much time away. It's quite nice just to switch off and and just have a life outside. Because although we're although a lot of the lads here are in the public eye, a lot they're they're still normal blokes and still enjoy their sort of smaller smaller pleasures in life a little bit more, like just going out and having a coffee. So it's nice just finding ways to switch off when when you're not at the ground. Yeah, it's good you you learn that because a lot of particularly when you're younger, you think that any time spent away from the sport or in, uh, away from training is kind of wasted time or time that you think, or oh, maybe I should be more focused on cricket. But actually, you speak to 90% of the top level athletes and by the end of their careers, they're like, I wish I told myself to be able to switch off and just say, you know, this is a sports person, but this is me is actually just a human being. So to actually have other things outside of it. Final little bit from you, Oli. Looking back now, and obviously you should be incredibly proud of, you, proud of yourself, what advice would you be giving those kind of that 16, 17 year old boy, girl who's looking to go into cricket? Were there things that you have really learned that you said, you know what, I wish I'd learned that when I was 16, 17 or some advice you'd give to them? Um, I think firstly, it's sort of from a technical point, it's about just having, having your own way. Everyone's got their own different way of, of playing, but also just learning the foundations, um, of the game and I guess at school I'd be I think from from a cricket point I, I gave it everything but I, I tried to do as much as I can as, and as much as possible and I look around I look around the, the England side at the moment and everyone wants to everyone's some good golfers some good sort of football players are in there and they're guys who are good all-round blokes and good all around sportsmen so let's try and almost dip dip your toes and everything and everything as well while while you're training if it's if it's possible because you don't want to from a mental point of view if I knew that if I didn't make cricket didn't make it as a cricketer then then I've got nothing um then that just it's just added pressure on you um so that's that's a little bit of it and I think my main thing now is and I'm still learning a lot by this is I 
I used to get so nervous playing for even even school games and club games and county games. I I didn't stop enjoying it, but it's almost realizing well, I've learned this probably over the last year that that the nerves are fine, the nerves are okay, the the negative thoughts are fine, the the positive thoughts and the dreams are fine, but just embrace them, take them in, but just also remember that that's not going to affect, that's my biggest thing, it's not going to affect that 30 seconds when the bowler starts running in, That's then you switch on then, just everything sort of goes into that 30 seconds. So, And that that's just a way of almost stopping yourself from thinking like this, the his negative thoughts and thinking too too far ahead and what if this happens what if that happens um because you've just got to be in that be in that moment on the pitch and that's a it's a pretty important skill in in life and in general i think as well is just trying to be in the moment and trying to whatever you're doing even if you're watching tv or listening to music is trying to just training yourself just to be there and completely present or if you're with having a coffee with a mate and this is what i'm trying to get be- better at is is just be be there. Don't put your phone down. You're switching off from everything else. All that matters is that conversation. That that then shows in in your cricket as well. All that matters is that ball that I'm about to face now. So I think that's probably the the biggest skill and what some of the guys are very very good at. And have you have you learned that through talking to sports psychiatrists within the England setup, or is that just something that you know every game you play, you suddenly start to understand what makes you tick, what works for you. Yeah, I think I had a good chat with uh, Joss Butler and uh, the psychologist as well. And he's apparently in the psychologist, he said, sat sat down with uh, Joss the day before the World Cup final. And apparently Joss said to him, he goes, um, right, tomorrow is what defi- this tomorrow defines my career. And obviously it from the outside, it doesn't. He's an amazing cricketer. But he goes, right, tomorrow defines my career. What happens tomorrow if we win and I play a part? That's going to be the, the biggest thing I ever do. And that's going to define how, how great I am. And and rather than sort of shying away from that, he he took that in and accepted that and accepted that mindset and that thought and then also told himself, right, yeah, tap the bat, I'm in. So that's – and that was a great example for me that – um that all it, all that matters is the moment, and I'm trying to still get better at it now because the negative thoughts happen. Just embrace them and and take them on and accept them, and and then um, rather than try and downplay the situation because because that's that's not an easy thing to do. So it's just accepting those negative thoughts or or positive and accepting that that won't affect you. So yeah, I'm learning that quite quickly. I don't know if I'd have the restraint if I was your your dad not to talk to you about cricket every minute of every day. <laughs> Like, like, one, just, just on on that one quick quick thing is quite amusing i uh yeah i told you i'm sort of reluctant to do it or I'm, I'm i'm wary of doing it and every now and then i when I, in the early days i used to drive ollie with his mate whoever it was in the back and um to get them from a to b and once ollie drove but i picked up picked him up from canterbury sorry and sorry and kent had played in the t20 and i had him and sam curran in the back and it was 2018, so it's the year of the, um, I think, oh no, it might have been 2017. Anyway, I just listened to them talking for an hour in the back, and I learned more in that hour than I would have done in months of sitting down with Ollie, trying to sort of prize out sort of, you know, answers to my questions. So, um, 